had um, a talk which said that um, the European Union is the continuation of Germany by other means. How complete do you think the domination of Europe is by Germany? And has anything changed since then? Germany, since the unification, has been bounded on it, Europe. It's got an enormous economy, it's got a huge population, it's, it's got a vast landmass sprawling across the centre of the western part of the continent. It has a powerful culture, literature, uh, and it's a very energetic country. It, it, once it had been unified, it was, it was bound to dominate the rest of continental Europe. The question was always how it would do this, and its attempt to do so by straightforward raw power twice in the 20th century and was prevented largely by outside interference from doing so. And it's, I think, quite sensibly resolved that it wasn't going to pursue that course again, but it seems to me that the European Union quite clearly is a device for allowing Germany to dominate Europe without being so ill-mannered as it had been in the past. And I don't know why anybody would pretend otherwise. The, the heart of the European project is the ADCA treaty between France and Germany, in which France accepts a symbolically important role, while Germany gets the, the, the true importance. Germany dominates the European economy. France gets a nuclear force and a, a seat on the UN Security Council and all kinds of dignities and glories which make it look important, but the real, the really important power in Europe is Germany. And of course, since reunification in 1989, that's become even more so because the reunified Germany is back to pretty much where it was before, a very, very big country which touches on the borders of almost everybody. Okay. And do you not think that since the election of Macron in France and the, the stalemate in German politics at the moment, does that not leave any room for... So this is top dressing. I'd say I've got no objection to Germany dominating Europe. It seems to me to be as natural as the Everest dominates the Himalayas. It's just bound to do so. And, and the European Union seems to me as good a way of any as managing it, though I've never thought that, that Britain should be part of a, a continental European political or economic system. And I think it was a mistake for us to join in the first place, a mistake which I think is now being increasingly acknowledged by people who realised that it hasn't worked out very well. The difficulty is in extricating yourself after 40 years of being in it. But no, I, the, 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 France's economy, France's population, uh, France's geographical position can't be changed by a change of president. And Germany's domination can't be removed by the fact that German politics are currently a little unresolved. The fact remains that the, the German continuous government, the permanent government of Germany, carries on whether there's a coalition in operation or not, and it, it, and it is doing so. It's not like the United States where the whole place stops between presidents because they have no permanent civil servant. So you referred earlier to the, the two world wars. Um, so if we're looking for other candidates for European hegemony, um, surely Russia would be the, well, this the is other the, one. This is the difficulty, and Russia is in Europe, but the, the Europe which has been constructed for the purposes of the European Union is a Europe which pretty much stops at the Russian border because it's quite clear that any political system in which both Germany and Russia try to coexist will be one in which they fight each other. So that's why all talk of Russia joining NATO after the collapse of the Soviet Union or Russia joining the European Union has been idle. It would completely unbalance these organisations if it came in. Its exclusion is implicit in the existence of, of them. And again, I can't see how else it can be managed. The difficulty is not so much in the exclusion of Russia, which is inevitable, but in whether the European Union readopts the general expansion towards the east that was the policy of the Germanic powers in Europe from about the 1880s, 1890s onward. And that's the difficulty that's arisen in Ukraine. Exactly. And do you think, like, now the EU seems to have taking its foot off the pedal in terms of eastward expansion, but do you think that this is something that might happen again? Well, on the contrary, I think that the eastern expansion is, is a settled policy, and I, one of the problems in what's happened since 2014 has been that Ukraine might previously have been a non-aligned country, which could pretty much indefinitely have stayed between the European Union and Russia and been neither in one camp nor the other. But the result of this has actually been that the truncated Ukraine, which uh, which came out of the crisis, 
is one which is very, very keen on a Western alignment and could, I think, never now be persuaded back into, into a non-aligned position. So I think the crisis has been made worse in the long term uh, by what's happened and will continue. And there, are, there are remaining big problems in, say, for instance, Georgia. And, uh, and, uh, Others. Well, the, the, here, is, here is a difficulty. The Georgians very much want to be part of NATO and the European Union. And there are some people in NATO and the European Union and the United States who think that's a good idea. So the idea hasn't gone away, but it's very disturbing to Russia if this sort of thing is pursued. Do you think that the UK and Russia, um, in terms of due strategic aims, are natural allies in that both don't want one country dominating continental Europe? Well, I think that's an old forgotten British policy, which we have no power to enforce any longer. Whatever balance of power exists in Europe is these days enforced and policed by the United States, not by Britain. We don't have any real ability to, to alter these things, and we haven't had any for some long time. I don't know. Um, it hadn't really crossed my mind. I, Russia, I think, generally operates on the basis that there will always be a threat to it from every direction. Uh, which is, is why that there is no positive word for safety in the Russian language. The word for security or safety, the principal word for security or safety in the Russian language is Biazapaznost. It's a negative word meaning without danger. Uh, they, they, they simply assume that they will always be at risk from their neighbours, whether from the West or from the East. And, and, and that is their permanent state of affairs and c current policy being pursued by the European Union and NATO and the United States doesn't really uh, doesn't really help uh, this get any better. I think that Britain and, and Russia have almost no uh, reason to have anything other than the sketchiest diplomatic relations. They have almost no economic contact. They have no physical contact. I'm, I'm often baffled as to why people are so preoccupied with Russian matters in this country at all. There was an old, it, it, there was a wonderful satirical column in the old Daily Telegraph, Peter Simple, and one of the things that he cooked up was an imaginary war between Sweden and Yugoslavia, which could never get going because they could never find each other and were so far apart. And any conflict between Britain and Russia seems to me to have the same characteristics. What would it be about? How could we find each other? And their navy can barely get out of its ports and, and, and moves at walking pace. Ours is equally immobilized. And apart from that, where do we come into contact? So why do you think uh, the British press especially is so anti-Russia? It completely baffles me. Uh, I think it's, it's partly that, of course, a lot of news is actually melodrama. And for melodrama you need a villain. And the Soviet Union having collapsed, there's been a great absence of villains in the great international soap opera of European politics for some time. It's made it rather dull, and so I suppose there's that. But the, there's a more serious problem, which is explored in Peter Conradi's excellent book, Who Lost Russia. Uh, and it's very crude and rather distressing, you say. It's almost like an old-fashioned Marxist-Leninist propaganda text. But the truth is that the, the, the eastward expansion of NATO and the revival of the, the new Cold War has been very much the work of arms manufacturers in the United States who lobbied powerfully for this policy back in the Clinton era. And all this is, is actually detailed in Conradi's book, as is the very interesting fact that George Kennan, who pretty much invented the Cold War and, and the Soviet threat, uh, was one of the principal opponents of NATO expansion when it first came before the United States Senate and said it was ridiculous and dangerous policy, which insulted those people in Russia who, at considerable risk to themselves, had actually, had actually destroyed uh, tyranny there, and were trying to restart with a clean slate, and he thought it was a great mistake, and I think Cannon had a mind far superior to the minds of most foreign policy experts and think tanks today, and I think his message should be remembered. Going back to Europe, um, talking of a, there's lots of talk now of a, of a federalised Europe, or an increase, the acceleration of the federalisation process now Britain has left. Do you see that happening, and does it have an ideology? I is? simply have no idea. It's often talked about, but I think that to have a, a really closely united European system, they'd have to have an inner European Union of those countries which were capable, for instance, of fully adopting 
not really a single currency, but the single economic policy which is necessary for a single currency to operate properly. And that would restrict it pretty much the original members, really, the, the, the original six of that. And what then happens to the many countries which have come into the EU since that era? And do they have an inner core and an outer one? And it's very difficult to achieve. Uh, though it must be tempting for, for Germany in particular to do it. On the other hand, Germany benefits greatly from the devaluation of the Deutschmark, which the existence of the euro represents for them. And it's, it's certainly its global trade is hugely enhanced by having a vastly undervalued currency in which to trade. And there is a theory that Germany feels it's gained more from this than it has lost from the, the economic chaos in the southern European countries, that, which never really been able to cope with the supposed discipline of the, of the euro. I don't know. I, it's, it's simply something I, I've got. I've got no personal knowledge of the people or the institutions in which such things would be discussed. You could guess that they might want to do it, but the practical difficulties would be huge. Do you think Germans are aware of how much the euro has benefited them? I think German business is very aware of how much the euro benefits them, particularly in trade beyond the eurozone. I'm, I'm quite certain that the, the, although German goods undoubtedly sell on quality, as they would say, they also sell on price. And the fact that they're trading in what is effectively a strongly undervalued currency must help them. Whether the people of Germany think so, I don't know, because the, the, the German working class, which I think you can still refer to, it seems to me to have undergone a pretty sharp drop in its standard of living in recent years, and I'm not sure they feel they benefited. The fact is, it would probably have been worse if it hadn't been for the euro. I don't know. I've, 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 I've never gone into it. Uh, Germany simply isn't as lapped in prosperity as it was uh, 20 years ago. Life's a lot harder there. And how do you think, um, specifically in Germany, but also around the rest of Europe, the influx of around a million refugees into Germany will um, impact on that? I think Germany has been very, very disturbed by the influx of what you refer to refugees. I would say migrants. I think that the people involved cease to be refugees once they reach Turkey. Uh, I've got nothing against people seeking to improve their lives, but I think we have to be, uh, how shall I put it, accurate in our description of, of people. that They didn't make their way into the into Western Europe because they were fleeing from something. They made their way to Western Europe because they sought the higher standards of living and the better opportunities which they believe it will offer them when they get there. And that's what they are. The problem with that, of course, is that uh, the, the people who are struggling most in the economies of the countries where large numbers of economic migrants arrive are those who are most affected by it. So you get a situation where you've got a very large number of people who are not fully assimilated and cultural clashes at the same time as you get quite a large number of people who feel that their that their standard of life and maybe their security of employment is, is threatened, which is not a recipe for stability or, uh, or, or, or necessarily optimism. And I think there's a big political problem there. I still can't really understand what possessed Angela Merkel when she pretty much threw the national gates open on this matter. I'm not sure she had the faintest idea what she was doing, but I've long thought she was an immensely overrated politician anyway. Um, so, <clears throat> sorry. The EU establishment in general seemed to um, be rather buoyant at the end of 2017. They seem to think they've overcome this wave of populism, um, despite several populist, so-called populist parties doing quite well in elections. Do you think we've had the, the crest of the populist wave? I have no idea. Uh, history shows that uh, these things are often entirely unpredictable and they may well be subject to forces which we, we can't conceivably prophesy. I mean, for instance, uh, if there is another economic crisis on the scale of or worse than 2008, uh, what then will happen to these so-called populist parties which have established a considerable electoral base and might benefit from that. Everything could be changed by a major economic crisis, and it's by no means impossible that there will be one. So I, I, I always counsel against smugness and, uh, and self-satisfaction at all times. I think people can be very uh, unwise to presume that just because they've got through the past year, the next year is going to be okay. I, I, I don't know. I think that Europe is undergoing, Western Europe uh, is undergoing, I should qualify that, uh, a period of considerable decline in the standard of life of its people. And this is going to cause political dislocation. 
as people realise that things are not going to get better next year than they were this, that they might actually get worse, that housing will be more expensive, harder to find, and secure employment becomes rarer. All the things that are rampant in this country, they exist very much on continental Europe as well. And that means that the political demagogues tend to do well. I, I wouldn't suggest that the crisis is over. Do you have any solutions? I have no solutions. I mean, I thought that you know, 20 years ago, when I first started engaging as much as I could in national politics, I thought that I had some ideas which might make a constructive difference. But I found that nobody was really particularly interested in listening to them. And uh, over time, it's come to me that, that politics in this country particularly is, con is conducted mainly on a tribal basis rather than on a basis of reason. And if you try to put forward a political program or political ideas on the basis that they're actually a good idea and will work, uh, you might as well go home. What you need to do is to mobilise a tribe. So, so you, you haven't seen any evidence that people are just getting tired of this tribal politics? Uh, well, they're getting tired of... Well, no, on the contrary, the votes for the political parties at the last election were enormous. Uh, people were returning to tribes. Okay. Uh, the, there was a, the referendum, which I disapproved of, almost created new tribes, which I thought were in the process of being born for some time. But of course, as soon as the referendum was over and we returned to normal electoral politics, the, the, the boundaries were completely different and they cut across each other. And we, so we sank back into, into partisan politics, which is tribal politics. Yeah bleak and rather depressing tone. No, 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 no. no. Pessimism is a very good way of staying cheerful. You mustn't assume that, that having a, a sensible, realistic estimate of what's going on makes you miserable. What makes you miserable is being ludicrously optimistic and ill-informed and then being slapped in the face by reality. <laughs> on, on that note, Peter Hitchens, thank you very much. My pleasure.